live? Oh, We're yeah. live. Welcome, Fabio Magrini. It's great to see you again. Hello. Hey, Andrew. You too. I hope you're keeping cool today, huh? I'm trying. I'm trying. Staying in, indoors right now. Um, now, here's the thing. Ever since Donald Trump first talked about hydroxychloroquine on live television, everybody's been talking about it and they can't seem to stop talking about it. And then we have doctors going online basically saying it. I used it to all my patients and they all survived. It worked. You know, why are, why are you still stopping us from using this drug? Like it's a miracle drug. It's the cure. They're calling it the cure. <laughs> why, why are we still talking about hydroxychloroquine if it doesn't work? And if it does work, why aren't we using it? Huh. So let me break it down. So first of all, it's not just Donald Trump, quite honestly. I mean, it's, this is the same in, uh, there is a, um, an undercurrent and, uh, uh, um, you know, a belief system that is actually running across different countries. I, I know that it's the same in Italy. You know, they have, they had the same conversation, the same discussions in Italy as there are here. The only difference is that they are not um, represented so much on a political spectrum, but they remain on to the medical debate um, level. I think that what is so extraordinary here is that this issue has become highly politicized and um, uh, going against uh, hydroxychloroquine or being for hydroxychloroquine identifies you as a, um, adhering to a certain ideology. So I think that that's the uniqueness that, at least from my perspective, I observe happening in the US. Um, why are we talking about it? We're talking about it because this started, you know, very early on, very, very early on into the uh, spread of the infection. I heard, the first time I heard about hydroxychloroquine was about probably the end of February in, uh, um, uh, from uh, some Italian um, uh, blogs uh, from uh, um, Italian doctors uh, dealing with COVID patients. Um, and that's where it came out. And um, what I've seen is a, is a discussion moving from an objective, scientific, legitimate questioning to a, an emotional uh, belief system that doesn't, doesn't allow any kind of, uh, um, um, you know, argumentation on either side. So there are two factions, the people that are for and the people that are against. And those two factions don't seem to be able to actually have a conversation based on facts on the merits and the merits of, uh, of hydroxychloroquine in well, COVID-19. Well, so you've got this doctor who went viral, um, Dr. Emmanuel, who's been you know, largely discredited since for her other beliefs that may, maybe, maybe it's not fair. You know, she's, she is still a doctor. He hasn't been disbarred yet, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd disbarred isn't the right term, but <laughs> she hasn't had her medical license stripped yet. So. And she says, oh, I've got 350 patients who have had COVID. I gave them all hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and azithromax, um, and they all survived. I've had no deaths. And so that, but, but that's just anecdotal data, right? I mean, it's, it's impressive, perhaps, but it's, it's still anecdotal. It's not, doesn't qualify as a, as a true clinical trial. So, you know, there are many questions. What were the symptoms in these patients? At what point in the infection were those patients treated? Um, did they really have COVID or did they not? Um, did they, um, how many of them actually progressed to be hospitalized and we being diagnosed? Uh, you know, how many were just positive to the test and they didn't have no symptoms? I don't know, there are so many questions around the methods that it's impossible to, to draw a judgment. It's her experience, you know, and I think that everybody's experience is valid in its own, its own, own terms, as long as this experience is, uh, is portrayed as my personal experience. So 
in my personal experience with my patients, this is what I've been observing, which is fine. But that doesn't give you the same weight as um, a randomized perspective clinical trial. So right. the problem with hydroxychloroquine, so I don't know where you want to start. You want to start from the scientific rationale. You want to start from the evidence that has been generated. You want to start from neither of those, or and we would just talk about the ideology and the methods that are used. Well, let's, to, um, <laughs> why, let, let's, I'd love oh, for other people to tell us where they'd like us to start, but I think, I, I guess I think we should start with the, his, the history. I think we should start with like you, like you just said, it was already politicized before Trump even mentioned it. And that's a, that's a significant thing. I don't think most people know that, that it was already a political issue. At least from my observation, you know, in the Italian blogs, there was a very sudden shift from uh, talking about hydroxychloroquine in a very objective, inquisitive manner to, um, um, you know, kind of derogatory terms for both people pro and against it. Um, so the way I've experienced it, or the, the, the way this situation or this uh, topic has presented itself to me, was uh, back in February, end of February, when um, Italian doctors uh, were struggling with coping with the COVID-19 um, uh, uh, pandemic in that country. Uh, and there were two things that were happening at that moment. First of all, the hospitals were overwhelmed. So a lot of patients could actually not get into the hospital. So there was an urgent need for trying treatments that could be used outside of the hospital. Um, and uh, the second uh, factor that played a lot into uh, that discussion was about the doctors and healthcare workers themselves who didn't have adequate protection um, in terms of um, equipment. They had to recycle masks. They had no effective uh, PPE. Um, and, um, and they were trying to find ways, pharmacological ways, to actually protect themselves. So um, there were two, so these two factors played into the initial conversation. And um, then, it, then we had Donald Trump in America basically say that he, he, he was pushing it. And why was he pushing it? Because his, the economy theoretically could be saved if there happened to be a miracle drug that would shut down the symptoms. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the logic behind it, right? That if you have a miracle cure, then all of the um, you know, pain and uh, uh, discomfort that we're going through right now is not necessary anymore. Right. And we all wish that were true, right? I mean, we all wish that there was immediately a drug that's already been tested, that's been around for decades, that so, just gets yeah. rid of it. Like, oh, no worries anymore. I mean, wishful but, thinking, unfortunately, right? Well, again, it, you know, and again, it's important to think about why we are looking at, why we started looking at hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine was not the first choice. The first choice of drought were steroids, or um, um, other drugs that are immunosuppressive. So- To stop the, the cytokine storm from, from right. reacting. So the objective of using this, this class of drugs was not to stop the infection as such, but actually to stop or mitigate the cytokine storm that, kind of, that came from, um, um, from the infection with, with um, uh, the right. virus. What's so funny for me, Fabio, is that the first I heard of, as soon as I'd heard Donald Trump talk about hydroxychloroquine and it was, it was well um, publicized because it was so contentious that he would pr promote this without strong scientific backing. The, the next thing I heard was a, a friend of mine who is a, a naturopath and I mean, a, a uh, functional doctor basically quoted a study where, where he said that, that basically using hydroxychloroquine in a certain study had increased zinc absorption by like tenfold in patients. 
and that he and that people are arguing that zinc blocks replication of any virus in your cells. And so I, I, I just, just took that to mean, oh, well, it, theoretically it does work. Well, what's uh, wrong with that? So that wasn't the intent, I, at least as I understand it, I would like to hear you know, the source directly, but as you explain it to me, my understanding is not, we are, we are not talking about an observation in patients because it's really difficult to measure absorption of zinc in cells in an in vivo model, right? So it must have been some kind of in vitro model. And there are a number of in vitro models that suggest that even on itself, by itself, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine can block a viral replication or entry into specific cell types in vitro. So that what means- What does that mean? It, it means in a Petri dish? It means in a Petri dish. So if you have a cell culture uh, and you then inject uh, the virus and then you treat the cell culture with hydroxychloroquine. Right. And these are not new stu studies, you know, those studies have been done for years. So there's been studies in uh, influenza, in uh, SARS-1, in uh, Z with Zika, with Ebola, with HIV, you know, with every single virus that you can think of, there's been a study with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. Because people are really st still trying to understand why this drug works in malaria, malaria, for instance. Uh, why oh, you, mean, drug... you mean doctors don't exactly know why it works? Not really. I mean, the approval is for, um, uh, the drug is approved for the treatment of acute uh, exacerbation of mal malaria. So again, it's approved to be used as an immunosuppressant or immunoregulatory drug. All those actions about viral uh, potential or anti-infective potential are all hypotheses. And none of those hypotheses over the years as coming from the lab has actually translated into, into uh, clinical outcomes. Just to give you an example, and it's in the paper I sent you yesterday, um, there's been studies in HIV showing that actually uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine block HIV from infecting cells in vitro. But we don't use a, a chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine to prevent HIV infection because that outcome in vitro does not necessarily translate into a, a, a patient outcome. Right. Right. So this is one of the first things that we need to debunk is that not necessarily a drug that works in vitro is gonna work in vivo. And not necessarily is gonna work in a patient population, in a certain patient population. If that wasn't the case, you know, we would have millions of drugs on the market right now, and we would have zero attrition in the pharmaceutical industry where only one drug out of 10 makes it to the market, right? So what, for, for 10 drugs that are developed in the lab and have all a sound scientific rationale, only about one makes it to the market because not all of the preclinical results translate into clinical outcomes. And so let's talk more about hydroxychloroquine in that sense. Right. It's had a lot of, you're saying it's had a lot of clinical trials already. And since COVID started, they've been doing tests on it to see if it Oh, was yeah. actually effective and that and what were those results so there have been two types of studies being performed um, the majority of studies have been uh, retrospective studies so people have been treated you know again taking a step back let's look at the setting this has been used as a you know bulb bulb um, light bulb moment uh, for people, okay, this is cheap. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's a, it's a uh, immunosuppressive. Let me use it in patients that are at risk of developing a cytokine storm, right? So, um, so doctors have been prescribing it reactively to patients with symptoms, hoping that they will get better. 
or they would not develop a cytokine storm that would put them on the respirator. Um, so there are two types of studies. One type is retrospective studies where after the event, you collect data that from patients, you know, that have already been through the uh, infection and uh, hospitalization of death, and you kind of retrospectively look back and see what's happened to those patients that were treated. And then there are perspective studies, which are studies in which there is a protocol being designed saying people with COVID-19 with these characteristics will be um, all tested with, you know, with, will be treated with a, uh, hydroxychloroquine at those doses and dosages and according to the schedule against a, a patient population that does not receive hydroxychloroquine and compare directly with the same patients with the same characteristics not receiving hydroxychloroquine. So the retrospective studies show very um, um, maybe promising, but not, not compelling outcomes. So, uh, and retrospective like studies have a lot of, um, of limitation in terms of trial design, of uh, um, weight of the different treatment groups. So in terms of statistics, they are very kind of difficult to interpret it. And at best you get a trend, right? So you get, well, the equivalent to my experience has been positive, right? but you're not getting, okay, 30% of patients actually benefit from this and those patients are those with those characteristics. Um, there've been three or four, maybe more, uh, perspective clinical trials, but the ones I remember, um, you know, in different patient population, one was the Brazilian study that was run very early on. This was in hospitalized patients and that looked at the mortality rate. And actually um, in Brazilian study, more patients had side effects than benefits to hydroxychloroquine. Wow. So that study was interrupted early. Um, there's been a retrospective study showing uh, um, multinational from the US and uh, other countries um, looking at hospitalizations and death rates. So of all the patients that have been hospitalized, that have been given hydroxychloroquine, how many died across different treatment groups? And they compared hydroxychloroquine on its own in combination with antibiotics, with azathromycin, um, and uh, against nothing, azathromycin by itself and nothing. So four treatment groups. The problem with that study is that the weight of each of those groups was very different. So there were more than 2,000 patients on hydroxychloroquine and only a couple of hundreds in all of the other groups. Um, that study showed that hydroxychloroquine was marginally better than nothing. So we are talking about a five to 6% differential in that, in that context. But it's very difficult to draw any conclusions because if you look at the confidence interval for each of those groups, they seem to mostly overlap. And when they don't overlap, the sample size is so different that it's very difficult to make direct comparisons. So the conclusions of their own study was that perspective studies are needed. Um, then there was a study published by Lancet, there was another um, um, retrospective study, and that showed no benefit. However, that study was quickly retracted because the source of the data was thought to be flawed or incomplete. So Lancet very quickly um, withdrew the study. The, uh, then there is another study I'm aware of I'm talking just the my major studies um, that was published on the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was in patients with early symptoms. So this is very early on, before hospitalizations, to look at whether it could reduce the rate of hospitalizations or deaths. And that study showed no difference, but potentially more side effects. 
So let's, maybe we should talk about the side effects next. Um, do, what are the side effects of hydroxychloroquine? Right. So first of all, what we need to remember is that hydroxychloroquine is, very, is approved, so it's currently used on a very small number of patients. So it's used in patients with lupus. The incidence of lupus is about, in the US, is about 0.4% of the population. It's used uh, in a very small subset of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And uh, um, these are about, overall of rheumatoid arthritis is about 1% of the US population. And then it's used in uh, the treatment of malaria, which in the US is negligible. Um, in uh, uh, Africa and malaria uh, ridden countries, it's higher. But again, it doesn't get to the levels of um, comparable uh, prevalence as COVID-19. So we are talking, we, in a way, we are comparing apples with pears, right? Because as you know, when you start using a drug very widely, then you start finding out about the more rare adverse effects and adverse effects. So in the populations where it's been used, hydroxychloroquine, requires liver monitoring because it can be toxic to the liver. It's excreted to the kidneys and therefore it requires also kidney, some level of kidney monitoring. Um, it has been shown to have uh, um, uh, negative effects on the heart, uh, on the heart conduction. So there is a problem with arrhythmias and uh, it has, um, effects on uh, uh, eye pigmentation and eye vascularization. Um, so these are the kind of four areas of uh, side effects that are known to be associated with hydroxychloroquine. Um, well, that sounds like a good reason for the CDC and the FDA and the WHO to perhaps say not a good idea, particularly if the success rate is not very high in treating COVID. So to me, there are two questions, right? What is the risk benefit? Certainly, if somebody's in hospital, right? And uh, is uh, at risk of life, and this could be a life-saving drug, you know, maybe that risk is acceptable because the alternative is a 30% chance of death, right? Um, so it's like a little bit like chemotherapy drugs, um, you know, that. We know that they are toxic, but people accept that the toxicity um, is acceptable in, a, in that context because the benefit might be greater, right? So right. it's that risk-benefit balance that we see with all the, uh, any single drug that is on the market. Um, but with that but too- The question is why, where do we use it, right? what patients, what people should use it and where it is safe to be used. And, and that's where I get really confused because, you know, I have conversation in which I got the data about hospitalizations and deaths and people say, oh, but look, in early patients it works. And then we got the, got the, got the data from the New England Journal and they say, oh, but they don't, care, they don't matter because they didn't use it with zinc and you need to use it as a preventative because that prevents the viral infection in itself. Right. And, you know, so we, we keep moving the target, right? And we keep not generating the data. So I think so, that, you know- So just, wait, just, just to, let me just grab on that right there. I mean, that's the question that some of my friends who posed is, is, you know, okay, hydroxychloroquine by itself doesn't seem to have good results. Mm -hmm. on COVID in these clinical trials, but what about the zinc? And you're saying like predominantly that was not its purpose. It was being used to stop the cytokine storm. It was immunosuppressant was its initial use, but it, it also seems to, at least in a Petri dish, increase zinc absorption in cells. So the question then is, would it increase zinc absorption in human cells could they do a clinical trial on that? Would that show right. different results? Yeah, but again, you know, zinc by itself is not an antiviral, right? It provides some resistance or some, some potential for 
um, protection to viral infections, it strengthens the immune system. At least these are the claims from the supplement companies, right, that market it. But in reality, we don't have any clinical data to support that those in vitro observations. So that is the disconnect. There might be in vitro, in vitro data that suggests that zinc might be helpful. But again, we don't use zinc to treat HIV. We don't treat, we don't use zinc to treat hepatitis C, right? We, right. It's, not, it's not that it is an accepted way to actually treat a viral infection. And I guess that's where a lot of the arguments are coming about is that there's, there's this more vitamin nutrition, Eastern medicine approach to health that's sort of at war with the Western medical approach, right? I mean, this is sort of a lot of the stuff that's, that's trying to be hammered out, at least that's where the disagreements and misunderstandings seem to be coming from to some degree. Well, the, but then again, to me, that's weird. Um, and I, I find it quite, quite difficult to follow from a rational perspective because why then hydroxychloroquine? Why single, single out hydroxychloroquine, right? There are really good studies being performed in China um, about the use of Chinese herbs um, in COVID-19 that actually show a reduction of mortality and hospitalization times. But we don't mention Chinese herbs. And I haven't heard anyone mentioning Chinese herbs as an alternative um, way to actually fighting COVID-19. There is data coming from India talking about homeopathy and uh, Ayurveda approaches uh, that are not discussed in any way or place with any level of emphasis. And my point is that each of those, and just to mention a few, right, each of those approaches have the same merit in terms of data strength, right? For all of them, the evidence is anecdotal. For all of them, there is a level of personal experience, but no randomized clinical perspective, clinical trials being performed. And for all of them, there is the same level of, uh, of belief. So I don't understand what is the attachment that we created to hydroxychloroquine, which is actually a drug that is used in you know, severe autoimmune diseases and even the patients that take them in those autoimmune diseases are not satisfied with the outcomes that it provides. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's, quite, it's, it's quite extraordinary that we talk about this drug that is 50 years old and is safe, you know, in, in, in this kind of broad terms, but actually we don't even think about the way it is used right now. Um, and it's all about theory. And I'm okay with theory, you know, I'm, I'm okay with that theorizing the effect of uh, anything. But then at what point do we move to actually um, testing this theory, this hypothesis in a validated, scientifically robust way so that we can actually, you know, she's got the, um, uh, the doctor that... Um, um, Dr. Emmanuel. Yeah, Dr. Emmanuel. She has 300 patients. Well, you know, get another 300 and with the money you're making out of the uh, publicity that you, you're receiving, you know, run a randomized clinical study, placebo controlled, where you actually uh, create data that is compelling, compelling, publish that data, and then you, you know, you are proving your point. It's a question of belief that I don't understand here. It's like the adherence to a belief system rather than to the data. And Fabio, can you tell us why it's so important to have a study with a placebo group? Well, because again, you want to look at the difference, right? You're not looking at the effect by itself. And uh, for any medicine across many clinical studies, conducted over the years, there is a consistent proportion of patients that respond in spite of no treatment. And those patients take placebo. So in every clinical study, 
performed between 20 and 45% of patients might have a placebo response. And this is across therapeutic areas, across studies, across phase of development. It's huge. The mind is, is so powerful. <laughs> it's not only about, yeah, it is, it is the mind, but it's also about the fact that we are individuals. We don't all react to medicines or to disease in the same way, right? So as people who get infected with COVID, one person ends in hospital and one person walks around the following day, right? And everything in between on a huge spectrum, um, that reflects on the clinical trial, right? Not everybody in disease course is naturally the same. So you need to compare like with like and trying to create a, a valid a comparison to actually state that something works or doesn't work. So far, the prospective randomized trials with hydroxychloroquine suggest that there is no benefit. That is the state of real, you know, validated science. The opinion and uh, perspective and personal experience of physicians on the ground seem to say something different. And this is not the first thing, that, the first time that this happens. You know, I worked on a drug where, you know, there was exactly the same issue. You know, we, we tested it in a specific uh, disease. The drug didn't, didn't seem to work. When we communicated the results, we, there was a revolt from all the physicians saying, I've been using this drug for years and it works perfectly well. <laughs> so, you know, what, what do you do then? Then there is that discretion of, of use, right? So that's where the physician must have discretion in using that drug in patients um, that they believe will respond. But that discretion should not overtake the objectivity of the data. So... I'm all fine with you saying, you know, it is my choice to take hydroxychloroquine or to prescribe hydroxychloroquine. But where I don't get it is then the fact that you want to tell me that the data says something that it does say not, right? And you don't want to perform the experiment in a robust way to show that the data actually says what you think it says. Right. So it's an argument that is not on an equal ground and it's taken out of context and it's put into a perspective that is ideological rather than scientific. Yeah. <clears throat> what, what are the other leading um, drugs that, that people are believing that might actually be more effective, that might actually be effective for this right now? Because uh -huh. I've heard people say that quercetin similarly, it seems to have similar, um, it works in a similar way to hydroxychloroquine, but doesn't include the same uh, negative uh, uh, side effects, which isn't saying much if, if hydroxychloroquine at, at most is, is a nominal increase in, in survival rate. Well, again, we don't know, we, we haven't agreed on what use people are suggesting. Right. I don't know what Dr. Emmanuel, where what patient population Dr. Emmanuel says the drug works in because she hasn't shared that data. And I don't know what people or physicians on an individual basis believe the work um, where they should use that drug because they don't release that data. You know, you share with me that there are people that are actually taking it to prevent. Um, the infection from COVID, which seems to me quite quite a jump um, from where we were like three months ago. And people like Laura Ingram on Fox News are pushing that agenda. They're 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 arguing with doctors, trying to get doctors on, like this Yale this Yale professor uh, Rish Rish, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, risk is how I pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, take a risk. <laughs> but the, basically saying, listen. You know, we we should we should we should be able to use hydroxychloroquine as a preventative. You use it before you're even sick to to supercharge your your immune system or something. Well, 
but that's not what it does. It actually doesn't supercharge your immune system. It actually suppresses your immune system. Right. So it actually has an inhibitory, an inhibitory effect on toll like receptor and T cells and cytotoxic T cells. And that's why it is used in malaria to decrease the severity of malaria attacks, right? Because those are kind of a, due to an immune reaction. And that's why it's used in lupus and in rheumatoid arthritis because those are autoimmune diseases where the immune system is hyperactivated. So the intended use is not actually to prevent, to boost the immune system, it's actually to suppress it. You know, that's where I get disconnected. Um, oh, so yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I literally don't know why we're talking about it. All right. We're not, we're not performing the experiments. You know? so let, let's zoom out <laughs> a little bit then. And just like, this is craziness. And, but you've seen this before, right? I mean, in HIV, a lot of the same, the same s sort of things happened when, when the AIDS epidemic was, was raging in the 90s, right? Well, you know, I think that there are a lot of similarities and there are a lot of dissimilarities. HIV was never politicized to this, to this level um, because it was believed to be uh, affecting only a specific class of people. Um, and uh, people that weren't really popular at that time. You know, we, we need to remember that in the US, this was the, the Reagan administration and the Reagan administration had uh, a very clear commitment to the fight on wars, uh, fight on drugs, and uh, um, the lack of recognition of the uh, um, LGBT community, right? So Stonewall, which was the first kind of um, manifestation of the presence of the LGBT community as an organized polit politically and ideologically minded uh, organization. This was like the 50th year anniversary. So it was only 50 years ago that Stonewall kind of uh, uh, happened. Um, so, you know, HIV was affecting mostly homosexual uh, men and uh, uh, injecting drug user, uh, uh, injected drug users. And uh, it took a couple of years, and again, Ant Anthony Fauci was actually um, instrumental to the um, fostering research and objective research in HIV. Um, uh, and he was, you know, a small researcher in a, in a you know, in a small lab at that point. Um, he, um, you know, we started seeing people coming into hospital with Kaposi sarcoma of uh, final uh, pneumonia. And everybody thought about this as a fulminant disease, you know, that basically if you caught it, you would die within, you know, months or weeks. Um, in reality, if you remember the movie Philadelphia, right? I mean, yep. the guy catches it, he starts developing, um, uh, lesions. Uh, you know, the lesions after a few weeks and in a matter of months, you know, he doesn't even finish his own trial, you know, to get his job back. So in a matter of months, it was in and out. So there were, this was the situation with the AIDS uh, pandemic. It very quickly became apparent that the disease was much more complex than, uh, um, than that. And uh, it wasn't a gay cancer. It wasn't a, um, uh, a disease for the only affected uh, um, injected drug users. So it wasn't associated to a depressed immune system it was associated with transmission, and that is a is a viral thing. You know, it's what viruses do. Um, but you know, the same with uh, with HIV, we had with uh, hepatitis C. You know, another RNA, RNA virus that um, is transmitted um, through fluids. So if you brush your teeth with some, you know, and share your, your toothbrush uh, with somebody who has hepatitis C, you've got a good chance to actually getting hepatitis C yourself. Um, but the symptoms of hepatitis C, you might only experience symptoms, you know, after 20 years, after 30 years. Some people is, experience very, very acute symptoms, but that's a vast majority, a minority of patients. And again, with HIV, the vast majority of people, now that the infection 
has become more or less stable, um, even without treatment, um, as long as they have low viral loads, they are almost perfectly healthy. But then the viral load goes up and down according to different cycles. And when the viral load goes up, there is damage being created and the disease can be transmitted again. Now, this is similar, this is potentially similar to COVID, right? Because HIV is a retrovirus. RNA so, virus, yeah. And so is COVID. So mm -hmm. theoretically, when people are, when people get sick from COVID, they, it might just go into hibernation in their body and, and have other flare-ups later. Is that, is that what we, that's a possibility that we should expect? So we, again, we don't really know. There is a, there is a lot of evidence about people becoming seronegative, healing, and then after months or weeks, showing seropositive again or developing some symptoms again. And this happened, you know, this has started happening, was first observed already in China. And um, that's why we have all this question about, do we create immunity to COVID or not, right? And it was never known, and still not known, whether these are new infections, reinfections, or just exacerbations of the same infection. So we don't know whether the COVID infection chronicizes, you know, becomes chronic. Um, and then it's a little bit like herpes, right? Where you have flares up or HIV where you have cycles of, uh, of uh, viral cycles, you know, kind of uh, going higher or lower. So what you're saying is that it, it could be like, like herpes um, when people, people have, you often have a, an, ex, an, an extreme breakout when they first catch a retrovirus like that, where there's lots of symptoms, and then it goes into hiding. Um, and so, so in, with COVID, we may be looking at people having flu-like symptoms, and then it goes away, but it's not done. Again, um, it is a it is a valid hypothesis. So, with all viral infections, we have a similar pattern. All viral infections that become chronic, at least, we have a similar pattern, right? So the first encounter of the body with the virus is quite traumatic. And in, a, um, in quite a lot of the patients, you might have significant symptoms. So again, with HIV, you get really severe, people can get very severe flu-like symptoms that then go away. With uh, herpes, you might have a really bad flare um, at the first infection, and then that goes away. Um, with the hepatitis C, you might have um, liver toxicity very acutely and uh, flu-like symptoms that don't go away. With Epstein-Barr virus, again, you might have flu-like symptoms that last for four to six to eight weeks and then they go away. Um, but the virus remains in the body and it creates a balance you know, there is a balance going on, a dance that goes on between the virus and the immune system, where they keep each other in check, right? So that's that constant kind of facing each other. And at some points, the immune system prevails, and then at some other points, the virus prevails, right? Um, but, you know, a virus as a living organism has a, as an imperative, which is survival. And survival for a virus when it finds a host is not to kill a host. Okay. I found this on the web for past <laughs> Check it out. I don't know why Siri wants to uh, speak to us right now. Um, so it's a it's a very common pattern that we are observing where we don't know whether this is an acute virus or a chronic virus. There is a suggestion that because so many people experience symptoms for such a long time after the disappearance of the acute infection that there might be something else going on. But as we spoke before, you know, finding a virus in an organism, especially when it's dormant, it's a little bit of a, you know, chasing a, a needle in a haystack because the virus is so small and the organism is so big. So it's very, very difficult 
And right now we don't have accurate cell-based assays that tell us whether there is a, a virus or no virus in the body, you know? Um, so I think that we lack the tools to make a final determination on the nature and natural history of this infection. Right, okay. So now just to, just to look at the big picture here of, of what we've been seeing with with all the hype around hydroxychloroquine, um, you know, it, it got hyped in Italy. Trump picked up on that. It got hyped here. People are very uh, aggressive about what they think is real and not real, regardless of having studies to prove it or, or not. And now we're we're in mid August and we're still arguing about this um, instead of moving on to something that may be more effective. Right. Um, I assume some researchers are moving on and have moved on because as you, you said, the, the, who and, the WHO and the FDA have basically said, don't, it's, it's, not, it's not good, you know, we don't recommend it. Well, you know, again, there is this idea that there is a cons conspiracy against to cover up hydroxychloroquine. Right. Let's be factual what the CDC, the FDA, and the WHO says about hydroxychloroquine is that there is no compelling evidence to suggest that it, is, it has a, a role or it is efficacious for the use. So because it has no compelling evidence, it cannot be recommended as a treatment. Right. That's different from saying they discourage it. They discourage it as they would discourage, as the FDA would discourage the use of any unproven drug into an indication for which there is no compelling evidence and no clear uh, demonstration of a, of a risk, be, risk benefit. So this is not unique to hydroxychloroquine. This is not covering up um, stuff. This is literally doing what those agencies have been paid to do, which is to provide um, recommendations on the basis of evidence-based medicine outcomes. Then we can discuss about the, and we discussed a little bit about the, you know, pitfalls of evidence-based medicine and how that could be um, negating some innovation in the medical field. But that doesn't take away the fact that we have a responsibility in public health to actually tell people how, how much we know, but at the same time, to be very clear to, to say how much we don't know. And not to make claims based on anecdotal data. That's great. I mean, that... I don't know how to, you know, how not to be perceived as a, you know, Andrew, I find myself for the first time in my life as, a, as the establishment guy. I always been the, the guy that goes against the establishment, that criticizes the, you know, the mainstream process. And all of a sudden I'm finding myself being here defending the establishment. Yeah. But it seems to me that we are just acting out of belief and uh, share the ideology rather than taking a step back and say, okay, where is the data, right? And why hydroxychloroquine? Why, why are we not talking about dexamethasone, for instance? So dexamethasone is a cheap drug, generic, been around for years and years and years. And uh, it, is, it has clearly demonstrated uh, a positive effect on hospitalizations and number of deaths. But nobody's talking about that as a, as a cure for um, COVID-19. Nobody's talking about, again, Chinese medicine that has demonstrated to be effective in uh, shortening hospitalizations. Nobody's you said that that really helped you with your COVID experience. I mean, personally, I taken, uh, you know, when I, when I got the infection, there wasn't, uh, the discussion about hydroxychloroquine was just starting. 
And here, nobody would prescribe it. And the um, treatment that was suggested was the, the combination that you mentioned, zinc, um, azathromycin, and uh, uh, hydroxychloroquine. Um, when I got sick, I started taking Chinese medicine and I was noticing an improvement in my, you know, in my breathing. You know, when I was taking the medicine, I could breathe a little bit better. If I wasn't taking the medicine, I would, you know, my breathing would be worse. Um, it would help my blood pressure. It would help my, my pulse rate. So personally, I feel that without that, um, Chinese herbs, with those, without those Chinese herbs, my disease might have gone a lot worse. But do I have the right evidence to say that? No, because I don't have a control where I didn't take medicine, right? right? So, That's where the time machine would really come in handy for medical science. Right, so, you know, I experienced a positive effect. I experienced like a, a decreased severity of disease. I didn't end up into hospital. I mean, I ended up into hospital, but I wasn't kept into hospital. I didn't, I wasn't put on a ventilator. I didn't have to take oxygen, you know? So they helped me and my evidence, again, it, on a personal basis, in my opinion, is as good as anyone that has taken um, hydroxychloroquine. The difference between Chinese herb and hydroxychloroquine is that Chinese herbs are very much safer than hydroxychloroquine is. Right. Um, so nobody's talking about those. Nobody's talking about the antivirals that have been tested in the clinic, some of which are giving kind of borderline results. None of them are actually giving very good results. Nobody's talking about the, you know, many drugs that have been tested um, and that have failed to achieve the efficacy outcome. So this is simply now hydroxychloroquine makes it look like there is a concerted effort to push vaccines, for instance. But they don't consider the fact that there are hundreds of clinical trials going on in COVID-19 in different populations and in different settings on a, a national and international settings to study potential treatments and cures for this disease. Yeah. Um, do, you think, do you think all this international focus on this virus is going to result in potentially some huge breakthrough with viral comb combating viral uh, issues in general? I hope so. Uh, my concern is related to the previous point that we were making is that I don't know that we understand the disease and the natural history of the disease well enough right now. And therefore, any evaluation of efficacy is based on a limited perspective. So, you know, yeah, if we, I think that reducing debt rates and hospitalizations would be a great, um, would, would be a great outcome, but we don't know whether then down the line, we're gonna have a lot of people experiencing complications or, you know, steep, uh, organ failures and system failures. Um, so we don't really know what this virus does, where it goes away, where it stays, whether once you have the infection, you build immunity or you don't. Um, so these are all kind of questions that need to be answered before we can actually design, you know, good, um, uh, reliable and persistent um, knowledge about, you know, what works and what doesn't. Does it make well, sense? Yeah. This is great. Yeah. Fabio, um, is there anything else that you want to add? I um, <laughs> I mean, I want to put it out there. I really want to have live discussions with, with people that support hydroxychloroquine in, in, in particular, not because I want to have an argument with them, but because I really want to understand and have a rational discussion on where they are coming from, because from what I can see of the data, I don't see the argument. Um, so I really would like to have some discussions on factual terms, not emotional, not political, not ideological, not about conspiracies, but what it's out there and contextualize it. Right. Uh, because I don't think that that has been done sufficiently. 
So if anyone wants to have a chat about COVID and, uh, and uh, hydroxychloroquine, just kind of reach out. I'm going to leave it out there. <laughs> awesome. Well, Fabio, thank you so much. This has been very illuminating. Thank you, Andre. I hope it was kind of provides some clarity.